Ladies and gentlemen, sports fans alike, welcome to another edition of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. One of the couple, two, three best podcasts around. So sit back, grab yourself a cold one and a pole of sausage, park your keister in the front room, and listen to Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. In Chicago, you know that all sports rock. The Bears, Hawks, Bulls, Cubs, and Tops. Pick your favorite, you can choose as long as the Packers lose. For everything you need to know, it's Bill Swarski Sports Talk Chicago. Bill Swarski Sports Talk Chicago. Hey, everybody, welcome to another edition of Bill Swarski Sports Talk Chicago. This is your host, Sean. And before we start, I want to mention our sponsors. First is the Rockford Ice Hogs. The next home game is Saturday, February 7th versus the Milwaukee Admirals. Puck drops at 7 p.m. The Ice Hogs pay homage to their all-time leading scorer when they return to the BMO for Jeremy Moore and Bobblehead Night. The first 2,500 fans will receive a free Jeremy Moore and Bobblehead of the former Ice Hogs great, courtesy of Dental Dimensions. Only 90 minutes from the city limits and fun for the whole family. Get tickets and more at icehogs.com. Then there's our latest sponsor, audible.com. If you have, head over to audible.com slash Swirsky Sports, you'll get a download of a free audiobook of your choice. Some of the titles I'm interested in, Tales from the Chicago Blackhawks Locker Room, a collection of the greatest Blackhawks stories ever told. Stories from the original years all the way to the 2010 Stanley Cup year. If football is more your speed, though, there's Monsters, the 1985 Chicago Bears, and the Wild Heart of Football. Or the amazing Michael Jordan, The Life, the absolute end-all, be-all of Michael Jordan biographies and one of the greatest biographies ever written. Check out any one of those titles or any of the other 100,000 titles for free by going to audible.com slash Swirsky Sports. That's audible.com slash S-W-E-R-S-K-I Sports. So I was going to talk some more about the Blackhawks in this episode and a few other things, but there was two pressing matters I wanted to cover first. First of all, I realized, uh, so a listener actually pointed out that I didn't give a moment of silence to Ernie Banks. And I'm really ashamed of that because Ernie Banks was important to the Chicago Cubs on so many levels. And he absolutely deserves my respect, your respect, all of our respect. So I want to take a quick second to honor Ernie Banks in a a moment of silence. I want to give my best wishes to Chicago Blackhawks great Stan Makita. Apparently he is not in good health and uh, we're hearing some bad things about him. The 74-year-old Makita is suffering from Lewy body dementia. So he's he's really struggling and not doing so well. And uh, we want to wish him the absolute best in his recovery and wish the best for his family as well. Uh, and with that, uh, we're going to start this episode. Is a little bit later on. We're going to have uh, Gary on talking about the Bulls and talking about the Cubs and Sox. And next week, I promise we'll do a Blackhawks episode. But first, I want to start off, as I promised, the draft breakdown of the defensive tackles. Last week, we did the quarterbacks. This week is going to be the defensive tackles. And Next week is going to be the running backs. That's going to be an interesting one. I always like to do the running backs. Uh, So, as always, I like to watch a lot of game film. This isn't things I've read. These are these are my observations based on on what I'm actually watching in the games. So I'll sit down and watch isolated clips of the gameplay of these players and watch so if I'm watching defensive tackles, I only watch the play through through the you know till the whistle and then go right on to the next play and only watching what the defensive tackle is doing. You, know, you get the most out of watching that one specific player. You're not distracted by What's the cornerback doing? Did a piece of paper fly through the screen? Was there a fight? Was there a false start? I really only care about what that defensive tackle is doing or whatever position I'm looking at. So uh, let's break down some of the the, the guys I've taken a look at. Uh, 
these are in no order whatsoever. I just sort of picked uh, a, a good handful of guys, and and I go through guys that I expect all the, all the first round talents, second round talents, and then depending on the position and how deep it is, I I, pr- I try to go in, all the way through the third and fourth, maybe even fifth round guys. After that, you just it's, it's kind of a crapshoot of who gets picked. So I'm trying to do as many of these as possible. If there's somebody I missed that you really feel I should cover, definitely let me know. You can contact us. Uh, on, you can go on SwirskySports.com and uh, all of our contact information is on there. Or feel free to tweet us at Swirsky Sports or on our Facebook page, Facebook.com slash Swirsky Sports. Let us know who we missed. And I promise you on the next episode, I will watch game film and I will report back to you. And I know last year a couple people uh, had some cornerbacks that they were interested in. And uh, so we definitely did that and went back and, and and it was always nice to go back and watch some some guys that maybe I missed out on. So we're going to start with Danny Shelton out of Washington. Danny Shelton, six foot one, 327 pounds. And his pros, he can shed blocks really well. He moves down the line of scrimmage to make the plays. Uh, he does that with, with you know, it's pretty impressive. He's smart at reading plays. So if you watch when there was a screen play, he diagnosed it right away. And instead of keeping running at the quarterback, he dropped back to make the play on the running back or to break it up. Uh, he hustles down the field to make the play. And that's that's always good to see a defensive tackle with that hustle and motivation, even when the play is on the opposite side of the field or away from him. Some of the cons, though, uh, I don't know for certain. I've never measured him, but just watching game film, it looks like he's got really short arms. And that's seems like a weird thing to say, but if you've got short arms, you're gonna get you're gonna get the offensive lineman mashing his body up against your body. And when that happens, it's really hard to shed the lineman. So what you're willing to do is your technique is you want to keep you want to keep the offensive lineman on your hands. So if the play starts going away from you, you can shed the block and make the play because it's easier to shed the block if you if you've got the guy in your hands. You don't want to get him engaged in your body because when he gets engaged in your body, it's really hard to to break that. And so look, when you have short arms, it's a, it's hard to it's hard to get that. Uh so it's hard to get that, you know, break the the offensive lineman and disengage. So looking at him play I see I see a guy with short arms and maybe it's just me being weird and watching but I I I I think that's going to be detrimental when he comes into the NFL. Um and like I said that also goes into he he goes into the blocker's body way too much. You don't want to have full on body on body contact uh because it's it's hard to it's hard to you know disengage from that. And then he uh he needs to add a lot of strength. Is he's just not overly powerful guy, and and I think to make his mark in the NFL, he's going to have to get a lot stronger. He's also really slow, even for a defensive tackle. Um, he stands upright too much, and he had a lot of hands to the face. And apparently, they don't call that as much in college that I notice. But in the NFL, that's that's a point of of, of notice if, for the referees is. Any hands that go in the face, you call that. And he has a lot of that. So that's going to be something that he's going to have to work on because if he's getting penalties in his rookie year from hands to the face, he's not going to be playing, even if he's good. Um, and he was too often pushed out of running plays. They just ran him right out of the play. That's that's not a good sign either. Uh, when, when I watch him play, I definitely see a 3-4 defensive tackle um, I don't know if he's going to be able to play any other position, but he's at least an interesting prospect there. Next up is Malcolm Brown, six foot four, three hundred twenty pounds out of Texas. Pros: He's really quick, really athletic. He plays fast. He doesn't quit on the plays, uh, even when they go away from him. Cons: He also needs to get way stronger. He he's not that strong of a guy. He needs to get better at hand fighting to shed blocks. Watching him play, he could either play the nose tackle or three technique, but he's definitely a 4-3 defensive tackle. I don't see him playing in the three. And then a guy I liked a lot is 
is Leonard Williams, six foot five, two hundred ninety-eight pounds out of USC. Pros, he is a great pass rusher. He's really athletic. He's got a mean streak. He is hard to block. He can play either defensive tackle or defensive end. And he looks like a man among boys when he's out there playing. He's really strong. He could take a 300-pound lineman and just drive him all the way back. And not just barely, but just take him and drive him back with speed and power. Uh, and he can beat you with multiple moves to the quarterback. Cons, kind of immature. If you watch him play, and this is just what I'm watching on the field, is you saw a lot of dumb penalties. And that, that just can't happen in the NFL. He's t- way too prone for a late hit. He is not a disciplined player at all. He quits on plays when they're not around him. But if you watch this, he's a really intriguing guy. He can play any position on the defensive line. He could play in any scheme. He's just a player. You know, he he's just a really good player, and, and somebody's gonna get a steal with this guy. He's gonna be a definite first rounder. Then there's Eddie Goldman, six foot three, three hundred and fourteen pounds out of Florida State. He is lightning quick. Really strong, great at shooting the gaps and getting to the quarterback. Uh, cons, he doesn't contain his gaps very well. Miss, like, there's a lot of plays where the the play will be a big gain and right through the gap that he's he's got to get uh, that he's got to contain, and he can be moved out of the run play pretty easily for a, for a reasonably good offensive lineman. He reminds me a lot of Stephen Paya of the Bears. And he's likely going to be a three technique in this league. I think he's got a lot of promise, but he's going to have to be utilized well in order to to be uh, the best productivity on the field. And then there was one I was really excited to see more of because he's getting a lot of hype. Is Michael Bennett, six foot two, two hundred eighty eight pounds out of Ohio State. He blows up gaps off the snap so quickly. It's almost like he's a false start every time because he's in there so quickly. He causes chaos with his penetration. Very strong, quick for his size. He showed up at his biggest in the biggest games, which is always good. But he's a bit of a liability on the run. He'll run himself right out of plays. He can be pushed out uh, when it's a, a straight run play. He can be pushed right out of his hole. He's going to need to develop a lot better hands in order to uh, take to keep progressing at the NFL level. He's a definite three technique, uh, and I think he's going to be somebody that that's going to be. You're going to look back on him and go, "Damn, why didn't we draft this guy earlier?" Uh, then there's Jordan Phillips, six foot six, three hundred thirty four pounds out of Oklahoma. He is really stout. He looks like the rock of Gibraltar out there in the middle. He just clogs up that whole middle, takes up multiple blockers trying to shove him out of the way. And for a big guy, he's reasonably quick. He can get after the quarterback a little bit. I mean, you know, you're not looking at a, an Adamakon Sue or anything, but he can actually get to the quarterback a little bit. And he's pretty athletic for the size that he is. But if you watch him, there's no sophistication on the moves. He just, you know, there's he's got the one move, and if he doesn't beat you, that's it. Uh, he just util- uh, he just utilizes this, his size and his speed and his strength in order to get to the quarterback. And if if he doesn't get there, if there's no other move to do, no swim move, nothing like that. He's going to need to develop that in the NFL. And he is slow, even for his size. He's really slow. He's going to be a nose tackle in the NFL, and I think he'd be a really solid three four nose tackle. But I think he could play nose tackle in a 4-3. Uh, then there's Carl Davis, who was ranked pretty highly by a lot of uh, mock draft sites and, and people that I do respect. Um, six foot five, 315 pounds out of Iowa. He's a stout run stopper, good leverage, fairly athletic for his size. Uh, he had a really great practice during Senior Bowl. But he quits on plays. And, and I'm just tired of those guys in the NFL. He takes himself out of a lot of plays. Like not like physically, he removes himself from the field for certain plays. Uh, and he's not much of a pass rusher. Huge ego. He's really hard to project because he's got the talent to be a 3-4 uh, nose tackle in this league. But he needs better motivation. And I don't know. He's a guy that could be a real boom or bust. I don't, 
I don't know what to project for him. He's hard. I would probably, if I was a, if I was the GM, I would probably stay away from him, just because you don't know what you're going to get. Next is Xavier Cooper out of Washington State, six foot four, two hundred ninety eight pounds. Pretty quick, pretty strong. Not bad pressure for a guy his size. Quick to the gap, but he's not the most stout against the run. A bit of a tweener as far as positions. Interesting prospect. He could play a three and a fourth, three technique and a four three. And uh, he could possibly play a nose tackle in a four three. But uh, he could be a, actually a defensive end in a, in a three four. He's, he's not going to be the nose tackle in a three four at all. But he could possibly be a defensive end in a three four. The versatility that he has by being able to play multiple positions, I think that could move him up in, in draft prospects. Or draft position. And the last three, uh, Grady Jarrett, 6'1", six, six 295 out of Clemson. Quick feet, good separation between his body and the offensive lineman's body. Uses his hands really well. Powerful and disruptive. Again, he's another guy that's a bit of a tweener, though. Not sure if he's a three technique, but a bit undersized to be a nose tackle in a 3-4. A bit slow off the ball. Lacks foot speed to get to places. He quits on plays that are too far away from him. Uh, he's likely going to be a one technique or a five technique. So he's either going to be that, that nose tackle in a 4-3 or he's going to be a defensive end in a 3-4. He has some potential. One AFC scout that, uh, that I read a report on, that they likened him to Aaron Donald. I don't see that at all. Uh, I, 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 don't, I think that Grady Jackson has some promise, but I don't see him as... Is Aaron Donald. If you watch Aaron Donald's tapes, Aaron Donald is a beast. I mean, Grady Jacks or uh, Grady Jarrett is not that same guy. Uh, then Christian Covington, six foot two, two ninety five out of Rice. He's quick off the ball. He's able to make good penetration to, to to break down the pocket. He hustles after plays. Really great production in college, but he's a big time run liability is if, if it's on a straight run play, if he doesn't get that gap penetration and to blow up the play, he's going to get shoved right out and you're going to be able to run right at him. He needs to get way stronger. He's probably one of the weaker defensive tackles I saw. And he needs to refine some of his techniques. I don't dislike Christian Covington, but I'm not quite sold on him. I think his production and the fact that his draft or that this draft isn't that deep in defensive tackles will make him go a lot higher than he probably should. Uh, if he does fall to around maybe the fifth round, I think he would make a decent three technique. I don't know if personally, uh, if I'm the GM, if I'm going to take him any earlier than fifth round, but I've seen some, most mock drafts have him somewhere in the, the late third, early fourth round-ish. And last but not least is Gabe Wright, six foot two, 285 out of Auburn. Uh, lightning fast off the ball, great penetration skills. He can blow up Blackfield. Uh, but again, he's a guy that needs to get stronger. He gets swallowed up by blockers real easy. He's not great at shedding blockers to make tackles on the running plays. Uh, he's an interesting guy as well. He's not a he's not great at a two-gap run stopper. But when he just penetrates, he'll blow up a running play. Relentless as a pass rusher. Even though he's not that great as a pass rusher, he will hustle and try to get in there. And uh, if he continues to progress, somebody might have a steal with this guy. He reminds me a lot of uh, Timmy Jernigan from last year's draft out of Florida State. And then that's going to be it for uh, for this this round of, of draft coverage where we did the defensive tackles. Like I said, next week we'll be running backs. If you have anybody that we missed, please just let us know. Go to SworskySports.com and, and get a hold of us. And now we'd like to welcome uh, our friend Gary to the show. Hey, Sean. It's been a while. Yeah, it's been a while. How have you been? Uh, getting by. Was on vacation. Back. Enjoying the snow. I don't know if I'm enjoying the snow. <laughs> I had to walk to the bus. I, I'll send you a picture of uh, Derek Rose uh, shoveling snow around his Bentley if you want. Oh, my God. <laughs> so what is going on with the Bulls? Uh, nothing. I mean, they're just going through a bad stretch. It happens. I mean, it's a, they lost to the Lakers. Yeah, you know, 
when a team isn't playing well, they play down the team's levels, and that's what they're doing. Um, I wouldn't be worried. I, I'm. I mean, you could probably assume that Cleveland is going to pass them up, but it's not a shock that that's happening. Uh, I think the panic button can be hit if Milwaukee passes the Bulls up. Um, but right now, it's you know, there's there's actually quite a few good teams in the East, so it it is what it is. I mean, the Lakers are one of the worst teams in the NBA. They're they're terrible. They, yeah. Uh, I mean, if you if you lose to the Clippers, you lose to Golden State, you lose to Portland, you lose to Washington, you lose Toronto. I can get that, but when you lose, when you lose to a Clippers, or God forbid, you lose to a Minnesota. Well, they that, lost to Sacramento earlier this year. I mean, it, the team isn't you know the team plays down their competition. Um, I just, I wouldn't worry too much. I, I, I think that, again, if the team continues to go in the direction they're going, then then there's cause of concern. The other thing is, this is showing how important Mike Dunleavy is to the team, um, or just in general, that outside shooting presence that can expand the offense. And since he's left, you, you've seen Jimmy Butler's numbers go down. And I mean... I, you can't get to. It's a long season. It's. I mean, you, you remember when Cleveland was a couple games below 500, and everyone was saying they should fire their coach, and you know, LeBron does is is just pouting, and Kevin Love is going to test free agency and all that, and look at them now. I mean, 11 game winning streak. Yeah. So I mean, it it is what it is, and I mean, I think I think. This month, if the Bulls continue going that route, then that they have and since their new year, then you know there's there's cause for panic. But until that happens, I th- I think I think I think you're seeing just a team struggle and go through a, a bad spell. Um, I, I, we'll see and if they could continue in February. Then then I don't know. Maybe maybe something needs to be adjusted. But I think. There's only one thing I, I see that I'm not liking is Taj Gibson's forcing too much, and or I guess Rose is too. But other than that, I mean, they're losing games. They're not playing well. It happens. They're still nine games above or ten, eleven games above five hundred. I, I mean, the, the thing that bothers me is it's not like they're still early in the season. They're they're into the second half of the season. So it's it's something that, that that they've got to start figuring out because you you don't want to you don't want to roll into the playoffs and just starting to figure things out. That's a, a bad time. You need to you need to yeah. have how you're playing and, and work your way into that. So basically, this month, if they if they write the ship, everything's fine. If they're stumbling in to March, then there's some problems. Um, I just don't want to hit the panic button yet. I, I don't think you should, considering the way this team is built. Um, you know, they showed signs that they could play with the best. I mean, they beat Golden State in Golden State. And if you saw that game, that was the game, the best game of the year. Yeah, um, and, and prior to that, Golden State, it was 21 or 22 and 1 at home. Yeah, so I mean, you, you see the good along with the bad, and, you know, you just hope the bad decreases its amount. I mean, you can't lose to the Lakers. You can't let Goran Dragic score 40 plus points or however many scored against you and go from there. You, you Hopefully, hope, like I said, hopefully by March the ship has been right, righted or whatever the phrase is and that'll be fine. I, I think the problem I'm having is, is Thibodeau is a great coach, but it seems like he's having an off year as well. I mean, Kirk Heinrich is struggling, and he is Tibbs is putting him in for for some uh, log in of some big minutes. So I just I can't figure that out. the The defense is struggling. The team is is not playing well at home. They're thirteen and eleven at home. That that just says to me that they're that they're trying too hard. They're they're not they're in a, a rut. They're not trying or they're trying way too hard, and it's not coming natural to them. 
Sure, I mean, but the but the other side of it is they have a great road record. I mean, again, at 31 and 20, uh, which is, I believe, the record, I, I can't hit the panic button. They're on pace to win over 50 games. Um, Kirk Heinrich is looking old and is struggling. And um, then again, Kirk Heinrich hit that big uh, three-pointer against Golden State. Um, I... Uh, I think part of the problem is Noah is still recovering from his injuries, and him, the 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 rotation of him, Gasol, and Taj Gibson, uh, I don't believe is 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 going as smoothly as as we'd hoped by this time of the year. And I think a lot of it has to do with Noah's injuries. Um, I I think uh, it seems like they they they're they're. They clog the lane a little too much, which uh, dis- dis- disenables Rolls to drive, and then Rolls is settling for outside shots, and Jimmy Butler has kind of hit a funk. And I mean, it just it seems like everyone it, it's not clicking. And again, I wouldn't worry. It, it there's no need to panic unless they you know they're 31 and 31 in going into March, which could happen, but hopefully it doesn't. Yeah, and I just, uh, you know, if you look at everybody as on paper, you know, everyone seems to be having a pretty good season. It's just that uh, as a team, they're struggling on on defense, and they're, they're struggling being able to score consistently. Well, they get off to really bad starts in games. Um, almost every game they lost in the past month, they've lost the first quarter. Um and that seems to be it, it. Just it just seems to kill them. Um, they never can come back from that first quarter deficit. And you know, again, I, I can't panic yet. Um, it, if things don't get ba- better and they still lose to bad teams and they still they just they they continue to have a bad February, then there's you know then you can start hitting the panic button. I keep reiterating that because. There's the team is still playing well, e- even though you see signs of bad play. Uh, and you think of the last two years when they've played above expectation, they're still on pace to win more games than either of those two years. So, and we're in, and in an East that I think is arguably better than the previous two years. So, I can't complain, you know. Sorry, I'm I'm being optimistic today, so bear with me. <laughs> Which is funny, you're not normally optimistic. Yeah. So what's what's the uh, the timetable from Mike Dunleavy uh, Mike Dunleavy returning? Who knows? Isn't he day to day? Like I mean, he's been day to day for like two weeks now. They need him. He it, it's funny because when when he was when he was out, you saw Jimmy Butler's numbers drop dramatically. And um, particularly his shooting percentage, um, and you know you think, oh, thirty-four-year-old Mike Dunleavy, what what good is he? And he he actually helped the offense and defense out so much because if you if you follow the Bulls, even though Jimmy Butler is the two guard, what you see a lot is Jimmy Butler is guarding the best shooter of the other team, which in eight, which is usually the small forward. And that, and that enables Mike Dunleavy to guard what would be the two guard of the other team. And Dunleavy has like five inches in on average on a two guard. So what you what you saw was Dunleavy was able to contain two guards. Now you don't have that. You don't have that with Tony Snell, and you know guards are just killing the Bulls right now. And you know, big men are killing the bulls, and it seems like everyone's killing the bulls. And like you take that piece, that one piece out that you didn't think was an important, you know, cog in in offense and defense because he is a role player. You take him out, and then all of a sudden, it seems like everyone's exposed. So, well, I mean, Dunleavy's also what is he six nine six ten? Yeah, yeah. He's so six, he's he, he's a he's a good rebounder. And he also, if if you watch him play, he's really good at moving the ball. So yeah. If, he, so when he's out, yeah. you you notice the Bulls get a lot more stagnant on offense. 
and he keeps the ball moving, which is which is a really good thing for the Bulls, is because they don't have like a LeBron James, you know. Until, well, until... I think what... sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I think what you're referring to is is how well he moves off a screen, how he comes off a screen and he's able to you know catch and shoot. You don't really have anyone on the Bulls doing that. You know, you had Kyle Korver doing that. You had Marco Bellinelli do that, doing that, and Dunleavy is, is really, really good at that. So you have that offensive player that can come around the screen and catch and shoot, whereas now you have offensive players who come around the screen and then they drive to the lane, and teams are expecting that. So, yeah, it's it's a big loss. Like, it, it, And that's why another reason why you can't hit the panic button is they've had injuries. You know, if, if they were completely healthy... Um, it'd be another story, but you know they they've had injuries, and and I'm sorry, Tony Snell, is is as much as he shows like spurts, and in, in like couple minutes a game of, of playing really well, overall his he's not been a, a good answer to Dunleavy being out. I actually question if there's anything I would question Tibbs is why doesn't he go with Miritich at small forward more, more often? He tends to do it late in the games. Why does he do at the beginning of games? I can't tell you. His his rotations make me scratch my head sometimes. <laughs> well, I mean, you, you you have to love the rotation of, of Butler, Rose, Miritich, Gasol, and Noah when that lineup's in. And that's usually the end of the game lineup. But the problem is, of late, they're trying to play catch-up with that lineup. And then you have to have Brooks in because you need more of an, more offense. Um so, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. He feels safer with Snell on defense, I guess. I, have, I haven't seen anything that makes me agree with that. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know why Snell keeps getting minutes. Uh, kind of like Heinrich from that perspective. Those two guys get about 35, 40 minutes between them a game. You know, that, that's, a, that's a good chunk. Heinrich is averaging... Over 27 minutes a game. Yeah. Well, I mean, well, you know, that's probably more because Heinrich is Tibble's favorite, but he is old and getting worse, and he has had times when he's played well, but I mean, he's just overmatched at times as well. So, yeah, I mean, I'm hoping. That when Dunleavy comes back, you see both Snell and Heinrich's minutes decrease a little, but we'll see. What about Doug McDermott? Um, well, he's kind of he's kind of in the first year in in the Tibbs program. <laughs> you know, he, he's in Tibbs' doghouse. He doesn't play much. I mean, what are you going to say about that? It's like he's not going to play this year. You might you might as well just assume that. He's going to get more playing time next year. Kind of similar to Tony Snell, similar to Jimmy Butler. You forget Jimmy Butler only averaged like three or four points a game his rookie season. So all those Dougie McBucket fans that are out there are going to have to wait a little while. It's just sad that, you know, Nazem Muhammad is averaging almost as many minutes as, uh, as Doug McDermott. Well, McDermott also had a, a pretty significant knee injury. Um, yeah. So he may not, he may not be at a hundred percent still. But still, it's uh, Nazem Muhammad is a hundred and four years old. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think Nazi's only getting playing time because Noah isn't fully back. Um, I think once Noah's minutes go up, um, you won't see Nazi. And, t- and t- 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 Taj has been playing really bad too. So, kind of need someone else to step in. Yeah. It's. It's weird uh, the, with uh, all the injuries Noah's had this year. It makes me think that he's wearing those weird French shoes again. <laughs> yeah, as you know, bottom line is as long as they're going on all cylinders come March and April, everything will be fine. Like, they're not going to be a number one seed. I don't think anyone's going to catch uh, Atlanta. Um, and Atlanta scares. I saw, I saw, I was at the game that the Bulls played Atlanta and. You know, Atlanta outscored the Bulls by eight in the first quarter, and they they won by eight. Um, but every time the Bulls made a push, Atlanta had so- something to answer. And you know, Kyle Korver 
couldn't miss a shot. I mean, it was, it was ridiculous. I mean, Atlanta's a really good team, and the, it's funny how losing Josh Smith makes you so much better. <laughs> I, I mean, honestly, I mean, they're, don't get me wrong. Atlanta's a great team. They What, do they won, like, 20 games in a row? Something ridiculous. Yeah. But uh, the, the team that scares me in the, in the East is – is Washington. It's the, they they are built to beat the Bulls, and they do a good job of it. it yeah, I mean, it, that goes back to what I was saying before. There's quite a few good teams in the East. You know, Cleveland's good. Toronto's really good. Even though I know the Bulls have Toronto's number, I still think Toronto's a really good team and a dangerous team. I mean, you're talking about five teams there. Any of those five teams, I wouldn't be surprised coming out of the East. Uh, I'm still optimistic it'll be the Bulls. But uh, I think that's more so because I'm a Bulls fan. <laughs> I mean, Milwaukee's playing pretty well too. I, yeah, I mean, they're not. If Mark was still at Parker, I mean, the, the Milwaukee's on the up, you know. Yeah, I mean, they're this is this isn't their year, but they've they've been playing really well. That that whole or that division for the the Bulls is is a tough one. Yeah, and you know, as of now, they're still first in their division, so. I, you can't get down. Um, it, I think. I think that the next couple. I think it was February twelfth. They play Cleveland. Um, that's going to be a huge game. Uh, I think. I think in general, all these February games, um, once they get off pack from this road trip, can be really important for them to to win. So, we'll see. I think. I think the other news that we keep hearing about we've been hearing since last year was the whole bulls management versus tibbs fiasco and what's gonna result in that i think that's an interesting i think if the bulls continue to move to not play well that's gonna just continue to gain steam so i just that bothers me because i it's just publicity that's not needed for a year that the team is supposed to be competing for a championship. I mean, anytime that there's any sort of trouble in, in the Bulls play, you always hear about the the rift between Tibbs and, and management. And that's and that's one of those backdrops that's always gonna be there as long as Tibbs is coach and Garpax is you know in the front office. You're always gonna have that that story. Whether it's it's still an actual factor or if it's something that's just in the media, it doesn't really matter. Is any time that the Bulls aren't playing well, that's going to rear its ugly head. Yeah, the unfortunate thing is if the Bulls, let's say, let's look at worst case scenario. Bulls don't win a championship this year and they get rid of Thibodeau. They're a couple years away from coming back if they get a new coach. Whereas if they bring back Thibodeau, they're right there for next year. It, it's in then with the team they have, they have to try to win the next couple of years, um, and they have this window, and they can't get a new coach. It it will totally change the direction of the team. And I mean, because you look at some of the ages of these guys, you know, Noah's thirty, Taj is thirty. You know, Rose is going to be a free agent in a couple of years, and I don't think you touch him unless he's willing to cut you a deal on a, a contract. A extension. big deal. Um, you know, you're going to give Jimmy Butler a max contract, so he's with the team for for the long haul, um, and he's who you build around. And him and Miritich and Gasol's 34. I mean, you have to win now with this team the way it is, um, and. Especially with all the money that's going to be available in 2016, you have to, for every team because of the TV contract, you have to try to win now. And if you do that, you can't get rid of Thibodeau. That 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 will just kill you. And as a fan, I'm I, that's like the worst scenario. Even if there's a rift between them and they don't agree with the amount of minutes that Thibodeau plays his guys and all that stuff, you you can't do that. It just doesn't make any sense. So, so yeah, sorry, sorry, I'm not uh, down about the Bulls. Sorry, I'm not. I, like, you don't have to be. I'm, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not down. I'm just. Uh, I'm just concerned. I, I think if they were slumping 
Uh, just offensively, I think I would be fine. I'm more concerned about their defensive slumping. Yeah, but um, the the thing about that is um, because their offense is more high powered, their defense is going to slack. Very, very rarely do you see like. It, in order to keep that offensive momentum, they they're, they can't play the kind of defense they've played the last few years. Um, for whatever reason it is, people are going to get too tired. You know, they don't have the right players. They they have different, you know, they have different transition from defense to offense. Like it, it just it won't happen. But I mean, I, I agree in the sense that wasn't expecting the defense to fall that much as it has, but at the same time, let's face it, their defense is not why they're losing games. They're losing games because they're shooting 30-something percent as a team. And they're and they're giving first quarters away, and they're not able to come back. That's why they're losing. So, I'm less concerned about the defense. Um, I just, we'll just see, you know, we'll talk in the beginning of March and see if you know, you can go, Gary. You know, we were seeing this in the beginning of February, and it just has ballooned into something horrible. Or they just went through a bad stretch. One of the two. So while I have you here, did you watch the Super Bowl yesterday? Um, I mean the Super Cheaters playing. Why the hell? Don't you run? <laughs> you and you have oh, Marshawn yeah. Lynch. Um, easy. Um, sorry, I re- a couple of reasons. One, I read this article about. Uh, by the way, I say that because I I, th- I don't like either team. That's why I said they're both cheaters. I don't like either. But team uh, either. um, I read this article saying that it was second down and one. If you pass the ball and it's an incomplete pass, you stop the clock. They had one timeout left. So I think the thought was that they would pass second, run third, call the time. Because if you run and you don't get an end zone, you have to use a timeout. So it was pass second. And then the third down, they basically, they could either run or pass. So uh, New England wouldn't, would have to decide how to set up properly. Um and if they ran and didn't make it, they could call timeout and try to go for fourth down. Um, and the other is, this is my personal opinion, is I don't think Seattle wanted to give Marshawn Lynch the gratification of scoring the game-winning touchdown of Super Bowl when he's probably going to walk this year. Um, I can see that one, but you have you have an absolute beast who's running the ball well through the game, and you're down at the one-yard line, and it's second and one, or second and goal from the one, and you, you pound it in. You just pound yeah, it in. If, if he doesn't make it, you call timeout. Look who your coach is. You have Pete Carroll, who thinks he's God's gift to coaching, and you know he still, to this day, comments on how New England was wrong for firing him and all this stuff, and um, you know maybe he thinks he knows better than everyone else. I mean, I think New England's done all right since they fired him. Yeah. yeah. But, <laughs> I, I mean, the way I look at it, too, is, and if you are going to throw it, you've got quite possibly one of the most mobile quarterbacks in the NFL. Why don't you roll yeah, him I, out? Yeah. So that way, the defense, who are, either the linebacker or the cornerbacks, are going to have to make that decision. Did they step up to stop the run and leave a guy open in the pass, or, or do they – they stay in the coverage and and potentially let him run it in. If my thoughts, my thinking on the on this slant play is, what happens? What happens if you throw that slant and the defensive back jumps the jumps the route and hits the the wide receiver early? You get a pass interference, and then what? You move a couple of inches closer. It's, you get a first down, uh, but it's the but they're worried about the clock at that point. So if you're the defensive back and is and is a referee on with 30 seconds left in the Super Bowl, down by four in the one yard line, are they gonna are they gonna be likely to throw a pass interference pl- penalty uh, flag? 
Who knows? I mean, I, I mean, not likely. So you you have to think that those defensive backs are going to jump every route they have. So what do you do? You throw a quick slant in the middle. Ugh, terrible, terrible read by Russell Wilson. Terrible call by Pete Carroll. Yeah, I mean, it, it's funny because all year I was calling out the Bears, how oh, they never do slants. <laughs> slants are all fine and good. It's just where you throw them. It's that yeah, that was a yeah, bad that, place that, to call. That, uh, yeah, sure. I mean, everyone, everyone who even casually follows football would say, "Would scratch your head? Why didn't Lynch? You, you know, you had three downs, you had one timeout. You know, have, Lynch just ran for like three or four yards." On the first down carry, like let Lynch run it in, win the Super Bowl, you know, go to Disney World, and you know that's it. But you know, it is what it is. I'm pretty happy Seattle lost because as much as I dislike New England, I like Seattle. I dislike Seattle even more. I think their 12th man thing is SNL had a hilarious skit on Richard Sherman and how his the fans were were like, oh, we're the 12th. Man, we've been there since the beginning, since 2013. <laughs> and it's true. It's like these these fans come out of nowhere. Kind of like the Red Sox fans when the Red Sox won the World Series, ironically. Uh, thinking that they're the gift of they're the best fans ever and all that. And it's just, to me, as, as a fan of a losing team, a continual losing team, it's just obnoxious. And, I mean, they're both cheats, you know. The whole deflate gate is pretty bad PR, and that's only going to continue to be talked about. And then, you know, Pete Carroll has a history of just being a, you know, crooked coach, especially in college. And, I mean, it is what it is. And I, I one, of, one of my friends who's a, a, a Boston fan, when I told him that, yeah, I'd, I'd much rather have – New England win than Seattle. He he kind of poked fun at me because he knows how much I dislike New England sports teams in general. But the reality is, you know, you don't you don't want the the you don't want the that and I hate to say this the team that you think that I at least I think Seattle is very classless. Um, and I think their fans are ridiculous, and I think their coach is a jerk and. Uh, you know, I'd root for any other team besides that in football. <laughs> Which sucks because I love Seattle in general, but that sports team in particular I don't like. So one last thing I want to talk to you before... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I went on a rant about oh, that's Seattle. that's fine. Oh. <laughs> is uh, the Chicago White Sox is... I mean, there's not much going on. We're in the, the doldrums of, of the off season. Uh Pitchers and catchers haven't reported yet. Things are sure it is. The Steamer projections projected them to win seventy four games. I think so. Seventy seven. Oh, it's seventy seven. Okay, so it's a four game uh, improvement from last year. Good, good to know. I mean, those are projections. Projections are projections. But I, I'm talking more is uh, is even farther into the future is. Uh, Keith Law ranked his uh, the farm systems and named Cubs number one, White Sox number twelve. Well, yeah. yeah, that's that's. And do you know who was dead last? Uh, was oh god, I, I read through it and I forgot. Um, Detroit. Wasn't... I was about to say Detroit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you trade away, you trade away all your prospects for these big hitters. You know what are you left with? I mean that's that's a good sign for you. I mean Minnesota's got a good farm system, but uh, yeah, Minnesota always has a good farm system. But it's it's, it's got to be a good feeling that uh, eventually they're they're going to run out of tra trade chips in Detroit. Yeah, no, I mean Detroit's def definitely this is probably the last hurrah before they're going to be struggling for a while. Um, You've also got the return of Gordon Beckham. Yeah, that was funny. I'm kind of down about that. As much as I love the Slayer, um, I wanted it to be the Micah Johnson era, and that's probably going to be put on hold because, I mean, from a logical perspective, if the team is, if the intent of the team is to battle for a playoff spot, you don't want a rookie at second base. You want someone with experience that is good defensively and 
It is what it is. I mean, you know, is what's Micah Johnson for this year going to add over Gordon Beckham? Sure. I, I, I agree with that. But then, you know, the previous conversations I had with you about all the Cubs future Hall of Famers <laughs> was um, – I say that. Sorry if I sound sarcastically it, sarcastic. It's just that you know you hear so much about how great everyone is, and they're they have the you know, they do have the best system, farm system, in baseball and all that. But it takes years for these guys to develop into everyday major league players. They don't just they don't just they're not Mike they're, the Mike Trout's of the world are very few. And the Ken Griffey's, yeah, these those guys yeah. don't. Yeah, it's it's always it's funny when you see. A uh, guy is having a good rookie season, and he's like 23, and you're like, man, and you know he's he's middle of his career in the NFL, but in, <laughs> in baseball, that's that's the real like the real life thing is you don't have too many guys come up when they're 18, 19 years old. Yeah, or even 23 for that matter. They they probably not until they're 25, 26. That's when they really hit their stride. So, I mean. The thing with Micah Johnson, he's 24. It's like, it's technically it's the perfect time to get him up. He's got a lot of, you know, he's got a lot of promise. Um, but I get it if they're trying to battle for a division. You know, he they don't they probably wouldn't want him to take his bumps in the bigs during that. They would probably want someone more s- solid with experience. So I mean, especially especially when. Uh, defense is defense is really critical in baseball. Yeah, and you know, with pitching at a premium is and hitting down, you need to be able to to turn these double plays and and, and the Beckham Ramirez <laughs> infield has has been very underrated through the years. It's actually really good. I mean, they're pretty solid defenders. And I mean, for as bad as a hitter Gordon Beckham is, he's a really good fielder. Yeah, and then they got him cheap too. He's getting paid less money than your boy Emilio uh, Bonifacio. Bonifacio, yeah. But uh, also, White Sox have three players in the top 100 prospects. That's, that's and one on the cusp too. Um, what's his name? Spencer Adams, I think, is right. No, he's in. Close. He's in. Oh, then it's Montes is the other yeah. one. the one that's on the cusp. Sorry, you know, you got them confused. Yeah, no, I mean. I think the Cubs have six, right? Uh, five, but they have two in the top five. Um, yeah, no, the, the Sox, Sox have prospects. It's 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 fun. It's fun to watch. It's fun. It's fun to. It's weird because you see uh, the Sox have a good prospect once every five, six years, and now to have several. I mean, they have essentially three pitchers that are projected to be a number three or better, which is pretty good. Um, and you know, Tim Anderson, he's their future shortstop if all goes well. So can't, can't complain about the Sox prospects. Um, it's, uh, it's yeah. kind of funny is I remember we talked a long time ago is before Rick Hahn got promoted to be the, the general manager for the White Sox, there was rumors that the Cubs were going to try to woo him uh, to the North side. And the Dodgers too wanted him. I mean, he was a hot commodity back then. Said, well, he was. It was funny. He was a he was a quiet hot commodity. Is his teams really liked him, but the media the media didn't pick up on anything, you know, like they do with some of the other names, just because he. I think I told you. Sorry, I to interrupt. I think I told you that I would be pretty upset if you left the White Sox, right? Yeah, you did. And uh, <laughs> I I kind of wanted him, and but it turned out well for both teams. Is White Sox promoted him up and. The Cubs, uh, the Cubs brought in Jed and Theo, and they both went about it different ways, but are pretty much getting the same results: rebuilding the farm system, uh, building new major league talent. It's, it's a uh, we've got we've got two. I mean, I think the White Sox have a much more legitimate shot to go to the playoffs than the Cubs this year, but the the future is looking pretty bright for the Cubs as well. And this is probably – I cannot remember a time when the White Sox and the Cubs both had good farm systems at the same time. Yeah. I mean, the, you know how I feel about the farm system. It's, 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 it's all, it all needs to translate to 
good big league clubs eventually. And um, the Cubs have, the Cubs in particular have been in position before where they've had a good farm system and it didn't translate until they overspent money on major league talent in the early 2000s. And then they got real good. And I, it, it's just, it will be interesting to see. I, I've told you all along that Theo has to spend now. He's got the farm system. He has to spend. And he started spending, so that's good. It just He needs to continue doing it. It's just about spending smart, though. It's you know just sure. spend to spend isn't smart, but they they saw where they they had deficiencies. They needed a number one uh, pitcher, and they went out and got one. They yeah. they needed a better better catcher, and they went out and got one. Yep, and 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 I think I think that's and we talked about this before the off season. My big knock was on, on him was that's what he needed to do for me to think that he was was not just listening to Ricketts and saving money. He needed to go out and spend some money, go out and get like getting a number one. And you said it all along, they're going to get a number one. They have to get a number one. And they did. Um, so I think I think it's good. I think I think there's a they're headed in the right direction. I th- Unfortunately, I think they're in a harder division than the White Sox. If there's any reason to assume that the White Sox have a better chance of making the playoffs this year, it's because I think the NL Central is a better division. Yeah, and that's not a knock on the AL Central either. It's just that the Cardinals are just a powerhouse. and Yeah, and Cincinnati's good, and Pittsburgh's really good, and Milwaukee's the one that you don't really know. You think it's going to take a couple steps back, but then Houston is up and coming too. And so, uh, I mean... It, it's going to be a really it's an interesting division the next couple of years. I think the the interesting position that the Cubs are in is that if you look at them, you don't know who is going to make that next step, and who that played last year of the young kids is going to be brought right back up at uh, for season opener, and what positions you're going to still need to fill, and which ones that guys are going to take a step up with. I mean, does yeah. does Javi Baez I- does he start? Uh, is he on the opening day roster? Alcantara is another yeah. one, right? Is he going to? Yeah, he's he's a big one. Is he going to be on this, the opening day roster? And I have high hopes for him because he's, uh, you know, he's got a little bit of pop in his bat and he's got a lot of speed, and he's a he's a and player that they don't have they don't have a lot of that. That's why I scratched my head on a Dexter Fowler um, trade. Um, I didn't think the Cubs needed to make that trade i get it he's he's a bona fide leadoff guy but i thought he's they the last thing they needed was to get another guy to clog the outfield and they have a lot of outfield talent i think they got a lot of talent but they don't know it's they don't have a bona fide three starters they've got a bunch of guys that 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 they don't have like a superstar set in 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 stone as the sure. outfield. And then, so they've got a lot of guys that they're going to have to platoon. And part of me thinks that the, the Dexter Fowler trade is that, is that they don't think that Alcantara is ready to be ready. the guy. And I think they want him to have another, at least half a season under his belt. Yeah, but if, but the thing that's frustrating about that and, and is that if the team is not, if the expectations are, that they make improvements, but maybe not to be an elite team yet, then you let Alcantara play. You go through it. You're going through the bumps. Kind of the opposite of what I was saying about, you know, why I think the Sox signed Gordon Beckham. It's like if the, if, if, if the Sox brass truly believe that this team is on the upswing but not there yet, then you play Micah Johnson every day or Carlos Sanchez every day. You go – you get the – you get the – I mean – Anthony Rizzo is a perfect example. When he first came to the Cubs, he couldn't hit a lick, you know, and it took him a while. And now look at him; it's the same. Well, I, you have. I don't think I don't think they're gonna just let uh, Alcantara like linger forever in minors. I think that they're gonna they're gonna play him at second. They're gonna play him in the outfield. I think he's going to be he's going to just uh, get some time and and. But not a lot of starts, and I think they're going to move him around. But he's he just needs he needs at bats. That's what he really yeah, needs. Yeah, and you you can't do that platooning, and that's that's kind of what I'm saying, is 
is you let him have his at-bats in the bigs. Um, Because that's the only way he's really going to learn. He's at a point in his minor league career where he's at, he's he's peaked. He's not going to continue to get better in the minors. So, I mean, that's just, again, I'm just, with the amount of money they're paying Dexter Fowler, it just, just, unless they're going to try to win a division this year, and you know, every team says that's their goal in the beginning of the year, but in reality, it's not. (laughs) Um, I just I don't I don't get the signing. I mean, I don't quite understand it either. But I, I think it probably has to do with right, sorry with uh, yeah you're right. No, I think it has to do a little bit with they don't know who's who's going to be ready come spring training, and I think they really do want to com- compete for for a playoff spot. I mean, it's it's a it's a tough road, but it's not. It's not that it's not feasible. It's not like it's not like the Cardinals are invincible. It's not like uh, Cincinnati is invincible. These are these are teams that they could could beat. It's sure. It's just uh, I think that they they want to have they want to have enough guys that when they go into spring training, it's not a it's not a you know any meeny miny mo. They've they've got actual guys that they can make a, a legitimate choice between. Sure. Yeah, but the the other side is you're paying this guy nine point five mil. <laughs> Not my money. Yeah, I know. I just, I, I again, like you could have gotten two guys for that. You could, in, you could have got Bonifacio back for four mil. So, I mean, it is what it is. It's it's fine. I mean, I just I just didn't get it. But that being said. After the bear season that we've had, um, it's and it's good to look forward to you know baseball. I mean, not that we're we're, we're spoiled. I mean, both the Blackhawks and Bulls are going to the playoffs, so can't look at things too negatively. But yeah. I don't know. The two things, the two uh, things I want to mention before we we wrap this up are: are were you surprised that the White Sox? Uh, Designated uh, Dian Viciato didn't trade him. I think they tried to trade. <laughs> um, no, considering how much they actually are losing financially, no, um, because you know how they signed him to that four point four million dollar deal. Really, they're only going to lose like seven hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars. That's all that was guaranteed. Um, and if you think about it from baseball finances that's not a lot of money to take the risk of trying to trade the guy and get someone in return so they took the gamble they lost um so it's only going to cost them 750k and the cubs are uh, have too many catchers (laughs) wellington castillo sort of has to go I, i mean you know, do you do you think the Cubs are are running themselves a little uh, into painting themselves into a corner at this point, as far as every team knows they have to trade him? Yeah, I mean it's the same thing with Viciato, right? It's, it's 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 like the guy the guy doesn't have a spot on the team, but he gets paid a lot. Get, what is Wilcester going to pay like two or three mil? Yeah, I think or something I think like two, that. It's like in the two 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 three. Um, for like a third string catcher, that's. <laughs> Way too much. Um, so I think I think they're gonna have to either eat some of that money in a trade or trade him for like you know the old Adam Dunn trade, a bag of balls. You know. I mean, the thing with at least with Wellington Castillo is you don't. There's not a lot of catchers out there. Uh, Dian Vistiato is is a guy that you could replace. Much easier than than a, you can a catcher, sure. and is Wellington well Castillo is he a solid number one catcher? No, but no, I don't. There's very few solid number one catchers out there. But so, but is he? Would he be a fantastic number two catcher? Oh, absolutely, sure. Yeah, and and two million dollars is not a lot to pay for a backup catcher or for a legitimate backup catcher. So I I think 
I think the market is there for him. I just worry that the Cubs have have themselves in a position where everybody knows they have to trade him, and they're gonna they're gonna lowball the Cubs and until the Cubs come down to uh, call up call up the Yankees. They'll always make the trade. <laughs> what do they have to trade? Um, I don't know. The uh, one of their thirty uh, uh, foreign prospects. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just. Um, yeah, th- I'm sure they'll get rid of him before spring training, which is in a couple weeks. I know pitchers and catchers reporting in a couple weeks. It's, it's can't I can't believe it's happening so quickly. Are you? Are you? Oh, I forgot to ask. Are you happy about the John Fox and Adam Gase and everyone else who the Bears? Uh, I'm. The I'm. V- John Fox is a very very safe pick. I I think I might have liked the Dan Quinn going after Dan Quinn, but when when you have a team that's in turmoil like the Bears, you need a guy who has shown he can turn around a team and instill it's instill discipline, but still be able to have a rapport with veterans. And that's exactly what John Fox is. You're silly to not hire him. He's got a a lot of experience. Well, he brought over Adam Gase, and wasn't he one of like one one of the rumored people too? And I know a buddy of mine from Baltimore was really upset because he wanted him to come to Baltimore. I I don't dislike the Adam Gase uh, as the offensive coordinator. I really wanted Kyle Shanahan, and I think that's who the Bears wanted as well. But he decided to take the job and with Atlanta. Before they even had a head coach, which is a little weird. Um, yeah, it is weird. So there, which makes me think that somewhere along the way, there's uh, some back dealings that probably shouldn't be. But Kyle Shanahan, I really liked. He's everywhere he's gone. the The quarterback has played much better than they should have. Uh, when he was when he was in Washington, you had RG three. Pl- People talking about RG3 being an amazing quarterback. He leaves. RG3 can't play quarterback anymore. You bring him to Cleveland, and suddenly they're on the verge of making the playoffs and behind quarterback Brian Hoyer. You know, he's he's a really he's a really good offensive coordinator, and I think he would have got a lot out of Jay Cutler. And part of me thinks he had the choice of going, I could work with uh with uh, Matt, Matt, Matt Ryan. Ryan in Atlanta or Jay Cutler in Chicago. And he made the choice of Matt Ryan is a much better quarterback than Jay Cutler. What are your thoughts on Cutler? Is he back next year? Absolutely, 100%. For two reasons. One, it's a huge cap hit for, to get rid of him. And number two is who plays quarterback. I, I mean, there's – in free agency, you're looking at Brian Hoyer – you're looking at uh, Jake Locker. You're looking at, you know, there's not good options. There, there's one thing to say. I, the, at least the backup quarterback position for the Bears will be a highly touted one by these veteran QBs because they know they'll get a chance to play. Uh, I mean, <laughs> maybe. But it's it's so there's there's no other real options. So they're sort of stuck. And as far as drafting somebody – is um, last week I, I broke down the the quarterbacks in the draft and there's I mean there's no there's no hands down awesome quarterback like in this draft like there is a few years ago with with uh, Andrew Luck or you know when you have a Peyton Manning there's nobody like that it's you have uh, Jameis Winston is a really good quarterback makes a lot of off-field poor decisions and very immature is he is he going to have the 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 capacity to to buckle down and be a the the NFL quarterback that you need him to be in the classroom and in the tape room I, I don't know and you have Marcus Mariota who who could be very good but he's also got a lot of questionable uh 
questionable things as far as how he projects in the NFL as well. So it's you take a lot of risks with these guys if you draft him in the first round. And the the other thing is, did Jay Cutler actually have that bad a season? I mean, I think the media played on it, playing on him made it feel like it was worse than it was. But statistically, he had one of his better seasons of his career. Uh, I it was. Jay Cutler needs somebody to just like bitch slap him for lack of a better term. He really does. He he needs somebody to go in there and and he he doesn't respect anybody. And and part of it is they have to give him reason to respect him. And John Fox is gonna yeah. come in and he's not gonna be afraid to bench him. I, I read uh Martellus Bennett came out. And said something about how Jay Cutler needs um, needs some discipline. Like it's weird that you're saying that because I literally just read that article the other day. Um, I mean, it's funny coming from Martellus Bennett because that's really the yeah, pot yeah. calling the kettle black. <laughs> Unicorn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, Jay Cutler just he needs discipline. He needs to play within a system. When last, not last season, the season before, when he when the team did well on offense is he played within the confines of the system. And part of it this year was the system failed him and he quit on the system. And that's a recipe for disaster because then you have the coach that's already, uh, you know, struggles as a game game caller. He's a, he's great at, he's great at uh, being able to break down the X's and O's before the game. But as far as calling plays in the game, not so good. Mm -hmm. And that's always been the knock on Tressman. And you have him struggling, trying to rein in Jay Cutler, and then it just makes Jay Cutler worse. And I don't think you're going to have that. It is Adam Gase can come in there and say, listen, I, he's like, I coached Peyton Manning, and he listened to what I had to say, and he's quite possibly the greatest quarterback ever. And so who are you to, to turn this down? And then you have John Fox, who's been a head coach for a long time, and he's not going to let this – these shenanigans go on. Sure. So who did a Bears draft at seventh pick? A linebacker? You know, I had a, I had a listener uh, write in and, and ask me this the other day. And I said, I, you know, I haven't really looked that far in advance. I've been looking at position by position of players. And he's like, well, I'm going to put you on the spot. So I said, all right. And I think they're going to go best available edge rusher and I'm going to go Shane Ray from from Mizzou and I think that's a great pick and I think that's what's going to be their pick I think that's what I read on Bleacher Report too someone suggesting that uh, in a mock draft uh, it's uh, as far as what's there um, you know there's always the philosophy of best player available and uh, that's you know that could be an offensive lineman. That that wouldn't be a bad pick on in my mind either, depending on what they're going to. But the problem is, is, is it's really hard to project what the Bears are going to do if we don't even know what what type of system they're going to run. If they're doing a three four or a four three, yeah. And they really don't have the personnel to do a three four, but they brought in a coach with a history of coaching a three four. Um. If they do a three four, what happens to what happens to Jared Allen? It's a good question. I think I think a lot of people are underwhelmed by him so far. So I'm not un I mean, I'm not underwhelmed by him. It's the same it's basically the same thing we saw with Julius Peppers. We were underwhelmed by him and then he goes to Green Bay and plays great. Uh I, I don't know. I, Julius Peppers had some great years with the No, Bears, no, but though. the when the last year he was with the Bears is everyone said he's done, including me. And really, I think it's Mel Tucker. I think Mel Tucker was such a terrible, terrible coach that he brought the worst out in his players. And I think that's what you <laughs> saw with Jared Allen. And you also have to consider Jared Allen had that that really bad uh, illness at the beginning, the, illness at the beginning of the season. Sure. And even when he came back from it, he was really underweight and didn't have his full strength. And you could see it. He had model, right? Uh, I can't remember what he had. He had some sort of viral infection. But he just he just didn't look like himself for the first several games. And then when he came back, he 
Uh, there was times that he just missed plays, and I, I think I think he's a legitimate, solid player still, and I th- you're on the hook for a lot of money for him. I, I think you know rather than I think the best type of coaches look at the players they have and base their system and how they call plays on the players they have rather than trying to fit guys into their own system. And and Fangio has been around the league long enough that I think I think they're going to I think they're going to try to do they're going to try to transition to a 3-4 but I think they're still going to play four. Something. I think they're going to play mostly 4-3 next year because that's the personnel they have. They don't really have the defensive tackles for it. They definitely don't have linebackers for it. Uh, and their defensive ends aren't really defensive ends in in a 3-4. And you don't have you don't have the cornerbacks to play the uh, the 3-4. So they really they would really have to could do a complete makeover in the offseason, which is really hard. I really see them playing a 4-3. Oh, that last question, Bears-related, because you're my Bears guru, so I always am interested to hear what you have to say. Um, Lamar Houston come, comes back, or is he done with the Bears? Oh, they signed him to a lot of money. They have to bring him back. It's just when he comes back. He's not going to be ready for the, the start of the season, I don't think. Uh, you think. You think he'll ever jump up and celebrate after a sack again? Uh, I'm sure he will. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure he will. Uh, but <laughs> the thing is, he's he's going to be much more motivated to come back because uh, the he got really down on the Bears' defense because he thought they were going to be something better than they were, and they're actually going to be better than they were under the new regime. And when he's when he's healthy, finally which is, he's probably going to start the season on on the, the pup list, uh, physically unable to perform. Uh, and he'll probably come back around week, or, you know, after the first six games. That's what I'm thinking. And if they do end up transitioning to a 3-4, he's going to be a great 3-4 defensive end. He's going to be exactly what the, yeah. the, the, the doctor ordered. Assuming, assuming he comes back healthy and... He doesn't jump after sacking people. Yeah, I mean the bigger the bigger concern for me is Willie Young. Is is he going to be ready for the start of the season? What happened to him? I'm I, I, knee I injury. Don't remember. Sorry. Knee injury. Oh, last game of the season. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. Yeah, so you're going to be thin at your defensive end position. That's why you draft a Shane Ray, I think. Well, I guess I guess that. That'll wrap it up. Sorry to ask you. Oh, a no problem. Questions. Thanks for being on the show again, Gary. Yeah. Hopefully next time we'll we'll have more positive news to talk about with the Bulls and you know we can talk about pitchers and catchers reporting. And I I'll be happy to talk about the Bulls as long as we're not talking about another Derrick Rose knee injury. All right, Gary. Well, uh thanks for being on the show. Appreciate it. So that's gonna do it for this episode of Bill Swirsky's Sports Talk Chicago. Thanks for checking us out. And make sure you're checking us out at Twitter at Swirsky Sports. <coughs> Facebook.com slash Swirsky Sports. And check out our sponsors as well. Uh, the Ice Hogs at IceHogs.com. And go to Audible.com. If you go to Audible.com slash Swirsky Sports, that's Audible.com slash S-W-E-R-S-K-I Sports. You can download Michael Jordan, The Life, or any of 100,000 other titles for free. Absolute free audiobook. All you have to do is go to audible.com slash Swirsky Sports and let them know that I sent you. And so thanks a lot for listening. And until next time, bear down. Cubs win! Cubs win! Cubs win! Oh, I don't want her, you can have her, she's a Packer fan, she can't fit in my van, and she looks like Remember New Yorkers, smoking crack is not legal on the plains. Bears, 31, the negative 7. The Bears! Oh, when the Bears go bearing down.